Um, okay, so uh, everybody, welcome along to the 16th Time for a Pint virtual get-together. A um, little bit of housekeeping first. There is the chat function, which lots of you have already discovered. There is a Q&A function, which is a little button along the bottom of your screen. We've all brought along a watch. We're going to take turns talking about our watches. You can ask us questions. I'm going to be doing some screen recording stuff and sharing a slide deck. Matt is going to be keeping an eye on the Q&A, which is the place to ask questions. Please don't do it in the chat. It moves too fast and we can't follow it. Um, we'll be here for about an hour. If you've got questions as we go, ask them. We will do our best to answer them among ourselves. Everyone okay with that? Yes, maybe. We'll see. Okay. Um, so as I say, it's the 16th uh, Time for a Pint Virtual Get Together. I'm Chris. I'm very uh, happy to be here with my co-host, Matt. Hello, Matt. Would you like to introduce one of our guests? Morning. Morning. Uh, yes. I'm uh, very pleased to be here. Jin Shi's Greg Dowling, um, a friend, fellow watch nerd, and um, uh, all-round watch, watch nerd, yeah, and clock nerd. Greg's the man with Thank the you, microphone. Um, <laughs> and I'm very pleased I'm to be <laughs> uh, I'm very pleased to welcome along uh, Paul Sweetnam. Paul is uh, the founder of Fairer Watches. Um, he is a watch collector, a big car nerd, a blooming nice guy. Well, welcome along, Paul. Thank you very much. This is this is only one down from Saturday Night Live as a, <laughs> a guest spot, so I'm very honoured. Thank you very much. I've seen the luminary that I've been on today. Yeah, I don't know how we've managed it. It's, it's basically oh, no, a dress book. <laughs> <laughs> All I can guess is that the people that have agreed after the first one happened didn't watch any of the others and have had no idea what they were letting themselves in for. You, you're, you're obviously struggling to get guests now. <laughs> anyway. I, I think we've had some quite good guests, and I think we've got some good That's guests today. So guests. Yeah. Good, good guests today as well. Well, today's the first of right. which... <laughs> anyway the first of which is Greg so I'm going to start um, sharing the slides and um, I have messed with the order of the slides sorry Greg um, all right sorry, we'll manage sorry. between us I'm sure we'll manage between us it's going to be a little bit of freestyle over to you sir tell me when so, to play so the first thing to say is I've cheated um, you are talking to me talk about watch and I'm going to try and talk about two and, and they're two watches that attracted me when I first became interested in, in watches. And one of them I was able to buy at the time, and the other I bought 10 years later. And so I'm going to talk about two of them. And I'm going to start talking about a really old watch. Um, probably change the next slide, Chris. Um, so this is a Thomas Tompion from 1699. Uh, I, I hesitate to be sure, but I suspect it's the oldest watch we've had on Time for a Pint. Um, it's a pair-cased watch, as you can just about see in this photograph. So it has an outer silver case that then encloses the inner silver case that the watch is in. Um, this is actually not a fantastic example. Um, the enamel dial you can see is much later. Um, it should have had a dial a little bit like, I think, next slide, Chris. Um, this example from Sotheby's, um, which is called a Champ Levé dial, but at some point the owner probably decided that he wanted a new fashionable um, enamel dial um, <clears throat> and so had that replaced and then subsequently that got damaged and so it's been repainted and re-enameled. It's also a silver watch, which is the cheapest sort of watch that, um, that Tompion made. Uh, he also made um, more complicated watches out of gold. So this is the most modest watch Thomas Tompion made. Um, next slide, I think. Um, the real reason to, to own a watch like this is the movement, which is really beautiful. You can see this lovely gold colored balance cock. Uh, maybe an interesting thing about this, uh, the gold color is actually gold. And, and the way that was done is really scary, uh, especially by modern health and safety standards. This is called fire gilt. And, and the way you did it is you dissolved gold in mercury, painted the mercury mixture onto, um, onto the uh, brass movement, and then boiled away the neurotoxic mercury with heat, leaving the gold behind. Uh, you're not allowed to do that, I don't think, anywhere in the world anymore. Um, so, so the question is, why do you want to own a watch that's 300 years old and doesn't actually keep time very well? Well, next slide, maybe. Um, this is one reason. Um, it comes from a really interesting time. Um, in 1675, Christian Huygens developed a balance spring watch and, um, and decided he'd want to patent it in the UK. 
Um, and Robert Hooke was very annoyed about this because he had tried to make a balanced spring watch earlier and he um, didn't want Huygens to get the patent. So he commissioned Thomas Tompion, who had um, made scientific instruments for him, um, and it was already quite a well-known watchmaker, to try and make a watch. Um, and this was the pl plaque that they decided to put on it. Uh, Robert Hooke invented it in 1658 and Thomas Tompion fake it in 1675. Um, and this was, this was an attempt to try and claim the patent and stop Huygens getting it. Um, their idea was they were going to give this watch to Charles II, which they did, thinking that that would persuade him of the truth of their claim and stop Huygens getting the patent. Um, uh, by all accounts, the watch didn't work all that well. The king gave it back at least a couple of times. And in the end, neither of them got the patent because neither of the watches worked well enough <laughs> to actually convince the king it was a good idea. However, after 1675, Thomas Tompion didn't make any more watches without balance springs. So 1675 is the magic time when the balance spring revolutionized timekeeping. Next slide. Um, the other interesting history is, um, is um, uh, you wouldn't believe it, but watches get stolen. And in this era, watches got stolen by highwaymen, would you believe? So this is an advert from the most famous book about Tompion. Um, and it, uh, it quotes this advert from the Daily Courier in 1714 um, about um, the watch by Thomas Tompion being <laughs> stolen by highwaymen. My favorite bit is, is, please return this watch to George Graham Clockmaker at the sign of the dial and three crowns. Um, and whoever does this shall have four pounds reward and no questions asked. I wonder if he got his watch back. Who knows? Um, so, so it's a pretty interesting period um, to own a watch. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe um, uh, you know, four pounds sounds like it was an awful lot of money in 1714. And that was just to get the watch back. So who knows um, actually what it was really worth. Next slide. So, so this is a really beautiful thing. And Chris, just, just sort of page through a few as you see, um, as you see fit. The real joy of this watch is the movement. Um, it's um it's a very complicated and handmade thing um and and when put together like this you can just see it's pretty spectacular um it's even more spectacular when it's going you sort of a clinky click and it's a 300 year old machine that slightly amazingly um still works um now, now obviously a watch like this requires um attention from time to time and i'm, I'm very uh, grateful to seth kennedy for taking a look at this at one point keep keep going with the slides chris um and this lovely photograph from seth is what the watch looks like when it was in bits on his bench now all of these pieces uh, were handmade and this obviously comes from an era when uh, watches did not have interchangeable parts and so one of the interesting things if you look at the next few photographs is you can see that uh, my watch is number 2987 and most of the interchange of the non-interchangeable parts have 2987 scraped on them um, not particularly very elegantly but probably somewhere that the owner of the watch would never see and this was to make sure that um, when the watch came apart and went back together in Tompion's workshop all the parts of 2987 went back together with all the other parts of 2987 um, and so a very interesting little bit of history um, in this era, of course, Thomas Tompion was not making watches himself. Um, he had a number of apprentices. I, I have in my head 30 at one point, but, but certainly quite a few apprentices. And at one point they started, uh, some of them started stamping their initials inside the watch. Uh, again, somewhere where the client wouldn't see it. And, and probably uh, my guess is Mr. Tompion wouldn't see it either. Um, so, um, so my watch actually has E1 um, stamped into it, um, which perhaps is the first watch that Mr. E made, or is, um, is, is maybe there was more than one E. Um, uh, the uh, Jeremy Evans, who is an expert on Tompion and, and used to work for the Mission Museum, has done a lot of investigation, and, and he has established that E was one of the apprentices, but we still don't know who he was. Um, and I think the next slide, there is a little video of, uh, it's a close-up of the, of the repainted dial um, and a little bit of the joy of the movement. And very shortly, we will get to a video which Seth very kindly put together of him putting the watch together. I'm so glad I didn't have to do this myself. I don't think I'd be allowed anywhere near this. <laughs> For safety reasons. Um, you really see the, uh, if, I hope Seth doesn't mind my, my saying so, but you really see the expert at work here, don't you? Mm. Um, I, I just, um, 
I love owning it, but I love seeing Seth put it together and wind it even more than I... Uh, that chain, <clears throat> taking photos of that chain at the weekend was amazing. It's so fine. So uh... It's a real high-tech piece of equipment, I think. Um, I mean, especially considering, considering the age. Um, so there we have it, I think. Um, uh, it's very hard to know which bits are completely original and which bits aren't. There's certainly a lot of work been done to it over the years. Um, and Seth was... Uh, as he was reshaping the movement and getting it to run um, reasonably well, he had to adjust um, parts of the escapement, which we're pretty certain are not original. Um, but it's very hard to know with a watch like this. And actually, it's quite hard to work on. Um, I, I, when I first bought it, I gave it to an ordinary watchmaker who was very, very talented. And he just found it impossible because you can't make a watch like this work perfectly. It's not like servicing a modern watch. You can't just... Um, so it requires, I think, a lot of judgment as to what to do to make it work. I have worn it on occasion. I, uh, my, the person who set, serviced it before Seth said, um, don't ever catch a train based on this watch, which I, so I never have done that. But I have worn it to the opera once, and it was quite nice having something that's 300 years old in your pocket. So that's the really old watch. Um, I want to talk about a second watch. I'm sorry for seizing more than my fair share of opportunity. I think we're watching the video again. <laughs> um, <laughs> watch that so I, we watched it twice. From the first moment I saw it, um, unfortunately, it took me quite a long time to save up money to buy one of these and to find one I could afford. Um, I do, however, remember the first time I saw one. If you can show us the next slide, Chris. Um, I went to a watch collector's dinner in, uh, in, in I think, 2002. Um, and that was the first time I short saw a Jean Resonance. Um, the, the serious watch collectors amongst you will see that the watch next to the Jean Resonance is the real star of this photograph, which is uh, Philippe Dufour Duality, of which there are nine in the world. And, and it puts the, uh, <laughs> if you, next slide, um, you can put it in the shade somewhat. But anyway, it was just amazing to see the Jean Resonance and, and this other amazing watch. And I still treasure this photograph of two watches with four balances. Clearly, as a physicist, I had to have one of these. Um, and uh, just, just to see that there's a theme to my talk, there's actually also a reference to Huygens because Huygens established um, resonance between clocks. Um, he had two clocks in his room and, and was mystified as to the fact that the pendulum is syn syn synchronized. So, so um, uh, you can certainly see a link there. I think next slide we probably see. Before we go on, Greg, can I just say, I'm, I'm clearly going to the wrong dinners. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think the other thing that made me laugh about this event, um, there was a very, it was quite a long time ago, but there was a very young chap there who loved to draw and design watch dials, whose name was Ming. Oh. Ah. <laughs> who subsequently, um, uh, delighted to say, has, has started to realise his fantastic designs many, 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 it was 20 years at least later. So yeah. that's quite he exciting. Was, he was designing movements as well, wasn't he? He was. And now he's making them, isn't he? And now he's making them, yeah. Um, clearly, um, Mr. Jean's uh, uh, kind of history and interest in historic watchmaking is indicated here, as we can see, invented and fake it, enters this watch as well. There we go. Um, so eventually, uh, next slide probably, um, I found a resonance I, can, I could afford. And sorry for the terrible quality of this photograph. Um, uh, this is a watch I used to own, and, and I was unfortunately also a victim of the modern day equivalent of a highwayman when at some point someone broke into my house and stole my watch collection, including this watch. However, before they stole it, um, at the time I was going to Hong Kong regularly on business, and uh, I took my, uh, those of you who travel a lot on business will know you often end up with weekends with not very much to do. And so when I was in Hong Kong on a weekend with not much to do, I went to visit the FP Jean Boutique. And the staff there taught me how to wind my watch, which is not as trivial as you might imagine. You can see the crown um, between the lugs on the top of the watch. And you need to know that that crown winds two mainsprings because this resonance is basically two watches in one case. And so it's really hard to wind. And so there's a special technique where you use two thumbs and don't let the click wheel return and, um, and you can wind it effectively. They also suggested to me that my watch would look even nicer if it was on a red burgundy strap. Um, on the next slide. Um, sadly, I don't have a photograph of my watch on a red burgundy strap. Um, it did look really fantastic, um, and I hope the new owner is really enjoying it. Fortunately, my super stylish friend, uh, Mo Coppoletta, also loved this combination. And so here is a photograph that I stole from, um, from a collected man of Mo wearing exactly the same combination. And I think they look. Thank you, Mo. Um, so sadly, um, my highwayman 
um, still a watch. And um, and then if, if that's happened to any of the others of you, I wasn't quite properly insured. I was partly insured. Um, but you then end up with someone sending you a big check and thinking, what am I going to do about my watch collection? And, and of course, some things you absolutely love and have to replace. And, and other things maybe you think we don't absolutely have to replace and maybe some things you changed. And uh, the Resonance was certainly one of my favorite watches, and, and I had the absolute basic standard model, but I sort of thought if I was going to replace it, maybe I'd see if I could find one of the more limited editions that I love even more. Um, and they're very hard to obtain because they're made in small quantities, and genre collectors are not particularly easy people to get hold of their watches. Uh, but I was very lucky in one of my trips to Hong Kong, I had met a chap called Brad Schwartz, who is, uh, was a um, uh, moderator of the FD Jean Forum on the Purists. Um, and, um, and I got in touch with him and said, I'm interested in replacing my resonance. And do you know where I might find either the uh, Japan Boutique Special Edition or the Black Mother of Pearl Special Edition? And my timing was brilliant because Brad Schwartz, who owns just about every amazing watch you can imagine, had decided to buy something that put them all in the shade and was so expensive that it even made him feel he needed to sell a couple of watches. And so he decided he would sell me his black mother of pearl uh, resonance, which I think is probably in the next version. Um, so this is quite an unusual watch and it's, it was made in 2005. Um, there were 10 uh, made for um, uh, the FB Jean dealer in Singapore. Um, the dial, which just looks black, is actually, um, it's, it's a sort of very dark, reddy brown mother of pearl. Um, and it's in red gold, which is quite unusual for a Jean watch. Um, so at that point, I was, um, and the photograph on the left is, is one of Brad's from the Watch Pro website. And it's quite odd owning a watch like this because, because there are years and years and years of photographs of this on the various forums and FP Jean dinners and everything else. And they're mostly on my watch. I mean, there obviously are another nine around the world somewhere, and you occasionally see one of the others. But, but mostly, if you see one of these, it's the one that I now own. Um, and um, again, so, so I really love this watch and you can see it on the left. It, it is very beautiful, but it maybe is a little austere for daytime. Um, and so uh, one of the things I thought about and the only thing I really missed about my previous residence is I really loved that red strap. But I just thought you can't possibly wear a red strap with such a distinctive um, red gold watch. Um, but my um, stylish friend Mo Coppoletta came to the rescue again and said, I think you're wrong, he said. I think it would look great. So the next time I was in the presence of a <clears throat> appropriately colored strap, I um, went and uh, tried it on. And um, my stylish friend, of course, was right. And it looks absolutely fantastic. I think it lifts it. It makes it a bit more wearable. It makes it a little bit less austere. Um, and I very rarely put the black strap back. Um, the other thing I really love about this watch is um, the color combinations of the red gold, even though I've clearly bashed it a bit, as you can see in this photograph, but the printing on the, on the um, quite soft black dial, the color choice of that printing and the way that goes um, together with the red gold case, I think is, is really lovely. Um, and that's why I love this watch. And I think that's why people love it so much. Maybe the next slide. Um, the other thing to love about this watch, and, and I should have maybe mentioned this earlier, basically this watch is two movements in one case. And the idea is that they are adjusted so that those two balances are very close together. And within a few seconds of winding the watch, if it's properly adjusted, I should perhaps say my first one that was stolen wasn't properly adjusted. And it, it could take uh, a minute or two for actually the whole thing to come into resonance and those, those balance wheels to lock. Uh, but this one is properly adjusted. And, and within a few seconds, um, you, can, um, you, can, you can hear it, the, the, the sort of beating tick stop. Um, and uh, next slide, maybe, Chris. Um, the movement is, is just a complete joy to behold. And, and in some ways, the movement itself in this generation of Jean is made of uh, gold itself. And so the combination of the red gold movement and the red gold case uh, really pops um, uh, when you look at them together in a number of lights, as you can see in this lovely photograph that Matt kindly took for me. Maybe next slide. Um, this is really just to prove that it is not just a plain black dial. Um, I stole it, it. This is incredibly difficult to photograph. Um, and I stole the photograph on the left from Brad Schwartz, the previous owner. Um, but you can just about see on this, this example, you can see the sort of flare of <clears throat> pearl, which you can only see in certain lights and you can see yeah. this ready brown color coming through. 
I, try, I tried to get it yesterday when I was photographing it. And thank you again for, for allowing me to do so. But um, I just couldn't. I think it was because I was using artificial light. Um, it, it might be that natural light works better on Mother of Pearl. I mean, the time I see it in these colours is mostly bright sunlight. You'll, you'll see it outside in bright sunlight and suddenly you'll get a, a, a sort of flare. Uh, and of course, you know, I can, if you look very carefully at the few of these photographed in the world, if, if you can see the flares of the Mother of Pearl, you can tell which watch it is because they're all unique. They all have a different pattern of flaring Mother of Pearl. Sort of quite it, nice it was lovely to see, it was lovely to see this, um, especially coming so soon after seeing that um, resonance from, by Breguet in the, uh, bought it sort of in the LA Mayor Museum. That's an amazing um, thing. And as you said, the, the, the screw in the center or just off center <clears throat> that allows you to move the right hand, um, the right hand balance towards the left is almost exactly how, um, how Breggy set his up as well. Um, so it's just, it's just a remarkable thing. Having handled this watch in a slightly dingy pub, I was amazed to learn that this was a mother of pile dial because I thought it was just black. I mean, I, I, you might even be, but some owners probably are the same, Chris. They've probably never seen it in sunlight, especially as it's a sort of after dinner watch in a lot of ways, isn't it? Yeah. You, you can only pass it one way. <laughs> that's uh, that's a, a club that's fantastic. Cool. Um, are, there, are there questions, Matt? Are there questions? I'm, I'm assuming. Oh, there's questions. one question. Seth said, What do we use the crown at for? Uh, the, the crown at, um, at four. Okay, so it's not really, it looks like a crown, but it's not quite a crown. But what happens is that um, when you pull it, it, um, it resets the two second hands to 12. So it's for resynchronizing the second hand. So if you imagine what happens when you wind the watch and it's, you know, when they stop, the two watches will stop at slightly different times. Um, and the way you set it is you pull the crown at the top out and winding it one way winds one watch forward and winding it the other way winds the other watch forward. Um, obviously try not to wind it too far because if you do, you have to go all the way around. Um, but that then still leaves the two second hands which are just at whatever they were pointing at. So pulling that crown out, um, there must be a heart shaped cam somewhere and it just does a kind of chunk and the two just reset to 12. And so you can reset it when the pips go off. Wonderful, thank you. Amazing. Uh, the other questions that we've had have been answered. So one question from James was about how long it took to synchronize. And the second was, um, was uh, are, the two, are the two movement times linked? But I explained they were independent, independent movements. If we had another minute, I was going to say, Matt, do you, do you remember we had a funny experience with Mr. Jean himself in this watch? I do. I do. Maybe we can come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> tell it. Tell it. I know what this is. Go on. <laughs> Uh, actually, it's timely because it was a Salon QP story. Um, it's hard for stories, says Wolfie. So it was, time, it was uh, Salon QP a few years ago, three years ago, maybe? Something like that, yeah. And I thought it would be really nice to wear this watch. And so I wound it up and was starting to set it, and, and it wouldn't set. It wouldn't set properly. Something went wrong with the setting mechanism. And I thought of, sort of thought, oh, damn it, I'll just wear it anyway. So I wore it anyway. And, um, and on the Jean stand at the, at the opening party was Mr. Jean. And, and I hadn't met, hadn't met him before, but I did meet him and he, you know, I showed him what I was wearing and I said, but I think it's broken. And, um, and he picked up the watch and he had a look at it and he had a look at the crown and he looked concerned and he looked worried. And then he, I'm, I'm sure, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure he clicked his fingers. It, it just, something <laughs> happened and this, this genie appeared to come to, to summon the manager of the, of the Paris boutique who was helping him. And it was decided instantly that this watch would be returned by their authorized dealer and repaired very quickly, which it was yeah. fantastically. It's good, good customer service. Yeah, that's the kind of thing I miss about Sound QP. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Good, stuff. good, good. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're on to Paul's watch next. Yes. Over to you, uh, sir. We're going to jump in the elevator and go down a few floors from the, <laughs> <laughs> from the previous watch to the rather a rather humble Hoya Bundeswehr. Um, being a, being a, I, I guess we can jump Chris straight to the pitch of the watch, being a, a car nut as I am, as you might imagine, I've been through every one of the well-notated Hoyas. So Silverstone, X, Monaco, not massively a fan of, uh, of that. Uh, several careers. And, and in reality, um, didn't keep any of them actually. Uh, bought all of these watches um, from Classic Hoya, which is just outside of uh, Dusseldorf. 
great guy, always appears at Classic Le Mans to um, obviously trade oil watches. And uh, just as a just as I was drifting, uh, I think 2005 Classic Le Mans, drifting past the stand uh, and, and really not wanting to buy another watch for a show, I was probably not going to keep and sell. Uh, this caught my eye and, the, you know, I guess perhaps an over overused description, but the simple functional simplicity of the thing, fantastic looking watch, um, even though it is circa 71. Um, we have the box but we, uh, and we have papers, but we don't have any date in it, unfortunately. But um, uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's somewhat contemporary. It has aged brilliantly. The font on the uh, main numerals is incredible, particularly the four, five, six, and seven. It's a beautiful watch. Of course, for those interested in the dangers of isotope, radium, etc., uh, obviously for the H3 on the, the dial, which is specific to this particular model, which 67 to 73, I think, uh, highlights the tritium that is used for the uh, luminosity on the numbers in the hands. A uh, couple of times, uh, folks have looked at this watch and said, ah, the, the, the hands are a later edition or they've been updated because the uh, lumi would or the radium would fade at the same time. But of course, that's not the case because the numbers on the black base dial would obviously fade differently from the, from the hands. Fantastic watch, uh, also has a flyback. Uh, and I think perhaps, you know, for those of us who lament modern chronograph watches of being uh, too deep in their girth these days, uh, back, at, back at, in this period, it's incredible to know that they could make, you know, fantastically, um, well, simple, but nevertheless a complex flyback chronograph uh, uh, watch that is just under 13 mil thick with the hexalite glass. Um, so uh, hexalite glass. So, uh, so it's a piece I've always kept. It, what are we now? 15, 16 years I've had this watch. Uh, I wear, I wear it probably kind of every month, and uh, well, it's never going to go anywhere. And it's a great, and it's a great addition to most of the um, Bundeswehr's I've seen. The black bezel has worn out and it's become silver metal on the outside. This has never been uh, restored in any way. So uh, a great piece and one of the few that I've kept uh, over 25, 30 years um, just because of this simplicity. It's stayed longer than most of your cars, hasn't it? Uh, it, it only hasn't outlived the 993 911. That's 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 the the only thing that it uh, actually. It's a great point, Chris. I haven't thought about that. Um, yeah, it has. It's outstayed every other vehicle. I actually bought it. Well, well I can't remember what I was driving at the time. I think a GT3. Um, um, uh, when, when I bought when I bought this watch, but obviously you know everyone relates Hoyer to racing, and this is this, this is something slightly different. Um, be yeah. fantastic if they still made pieces like this today, of course. It's very cool. I love the simplicity of it. Yeah, I love that it, it's so clean, like so incredibly clean and functional. There's nothing ostentatious about it. It's not been sold in the world of jewelry watches. It's been made for a purpose. And the flyback is very fast, you know, no, no point in having a flyback if it's not super quick. Um, and, and, you know, obviously has a, a, a function, a purpose. Hmm. So I think for that reason, it's never made, it's never left, a, it's never left the keeper's box, uh, along with Amiga's Chris, but I don't know, I'm not, I'm not going to mention those in your presence, or <laughs> we'll go off, we'll go off a five hour tangent. But um, yeah, for sure, a great piece. Very happy to own it. Love it. Really nice topography on the dial. Thing is very beautiful, isn't it? It's it's got that sort of dramatic beauty that comes from making something that's just intended to be utilitarian, but ends up not being. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 although they're entirely functional, very 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 small T above the six, which I don't think you can see in these pictures, and obviously the three H, and then the the simplicity of just the Hoya application. Uh, I think uh, you know. It, 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 it's just for getting close to perfection of a balanced dial, I would say. It's a question from the audience. 
this, the Zenith Corelli, or the Breitling CP1? It's a uh, three classic, if you had to choose. Classic Chronos. Yeah. Uh, I'd go with this. Yeah. I, don't, I mean, the, the, the Zenith is beautiful as well, it's, but it, in a similar way. Absolutely. Um, and although this is, yeah, although this is not uh, from the sort of, you know, from the um, Hoyer's racing um, well known models, it just that it does still have a motorized connection to me, although it's clearly an aviator's watch, you know, that's still. It's a motorized connection. So that's what, I guess that's why I've kept it really. There is that crossover, isn't there, you know, between motorsport and aviation and, you know, sort of, I, I'm, like, I think of Goodwood and they're very similar worlds, aren't they? And there's obviously, there's, there's quite a lot of overlap sometimes. Well, of course, there is a, um, a very nice airfield at Classic Le Mans. Where, yeah. Uh, the, great, the great and the good land, <laughs> the good land um, to race. Um, but yeah, of course, there's, um, I think, I th well, look, I, I think uh, along with a lot of these things we find out through our everyday horological life, there's always a connection with a car or a plane, not very many steps away from a watch, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, t I mean, I love the topography of, as you said, the four, five, six, seven, eight, and then Lee's, Lee's dialed in as usual. But the, the way that the numerals are bottom heavy, Yes. Kind of yes. anchored. So the, with the eight's a good example of that snowman eight. Um, and then, the, as you said, the beautiful segment across the, across the top of the four is just, uh, just perfect, really. It's, it's, a, really it's, it's a sort of salient um, reminder that there's nothing new in watches. There's just reinterpretations all the, you know, all the time because I think that the, I think the simplicity and um, a striking nature of this design you know there's a million chronographs out there isn't there but um yeah and it's it is interesting though because lots of people have eaten um eaten all kind of half numerals and on, on the subdials actually lee's just said something on the channel along the same yeah. lines quite often people plunge you know plunge those the, the numerals on top of the subdials and they just get eaten away but um but i've always liked the ones where, where they, that doesn't happen and there's something about the balance of those two subdials as well. They're not, you know, they're not, they're not too small and they're not too close together. And it, yeah, it just works well, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, simple but there you go. Very good. Thanks for sharing, Paul. Welcome. Um, Matt, should we have a look at your watch? Ah, yes. So yes, um, we're now uh, we've taken the the lift down a couple more floors, <laughs> and um, we're kind of. Um, kind of the basement but, but not that sub level where you know the important stuff happens the, the one the bit up that's you know where the cheaper cars are kind of parked yeah. um where the delivery is coming so this is the the unimatic u2 ab um u2 because it's the the second model they produced and ab because i think a is um uh the first of their first in their range and b i think because it goes a black dial um, I think they released an AG at the same time, which had a green dial and a brown strap. Uh, as with all of these unimatics, they were designed um, by a guy called Giovanni Moro, I think, um, who was an industrial, who is an industrial designer, and had touted a couple of designs around before, before um, uh, setting up unimatic five, six years ago. Um, this model was uh, 2016. Um, it's a, it's, I don't want to say twist um, on a field watch, but it's, it is kind of twisted version of a field watch. Um, in many respects, it's, it reminds me of some of those divers that I've talked about before. If you look at the way that the, um, the, the, the lugs are, uh, you know, straight across down quite narrow, they're, they're just like some of those skin diver watches we've, I've, I've spoken about a lot. Um, I just keep banging on about them, I suppose. Um, and then this very raised bezel, Kind of field field watch type uh, type layout, um, and from from the top down, if we look at the next picture, um, uh, from the top down it looks looks kind of quite normal. But then you see then the side kind of profile comes into play. You can see it's got this huge crown. It's a thirty nine mil watch, and that crown is eight mils. So it's about the size of the of the Hoya Chrono crown, um, maybe even a bit bigger. Um, 
uh, you know, let's say outsized, and you can just see this profile starting to, to maybe look a little bit odd. Um, and that kind of continues through the rest of the time. As I said, it's a, it's a 39 mil watch, but it's about 14, 13, 14 mils tall. So it's probably taller than the Hoyer we've just seen. If we flip onto the next, the next um, uh, picture, you see that the, the bezel sits really high up. And above that, there's a three mil double domed crystal, sapphire crystal. So you know, just to kind of like build up the layers even more, you get the chamfer bezel and then it, another three mil on top. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a beast really. Um, uh, loom on the back on the counter uh, weight on the back of the second hand and loom hands but uh, no other uh, loom to mention really on the dial. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't glow particularly well. Um, if we flick over to the next picture, you can see that completely bonkers profile. It's almost symmetrical top to bottom. Um, if you get rid of the, if you get rid of the, um, the crystal that is. So it's got a very strange kind of um, uh, profile where it tapers, um, tapers to the lugs, uh, both top and bottom. Um, and so, as you can imagine, it sits slightly strangely uh, on the wrist. I um, don't know if you can see how high that sits. Um, and then the profile is a bit strange. I, I kind of like it, to be honest. Um, it's a Seiko NH35A, so it's uh, you know, 21, 6 um, vibrations per hour. It you know, keeps decent time. It's quite fun. We flick onto the next. Um, Thing. Um, that's uh, artificial. Obviously, I used um, I used a, a torch that I bought from Schofield. Uh, they're cool things, actually. They're Schofield uh, torches. Um, but um, the, the the loom is really only on the hands and the, and the balance. The rest is just white paint. I think that's glowing. Um, and um, the other interesting thing about Unimatic, they they're almost all limited. So the each range they produce, each sorry, not each range each uh, variation on the theme is limited. So if this had a green dart, there'd be 150. If it had a brown dart, there'd be 150, et cetera, et cetera. They're very good at wringing bellies out of people. Um, uh, if we flick onto the next picture, the, one of the interesting things is the case back, which is machined stainless steel. It's about two mil thick. It's a proper screwing case back. Um, and it's got these um, these symbols on. I don't know if anyone knows why or can read the writing. Um, what these do, why, why they might be there. There is some clue. It tells you you need to hold your arm straight out from your shoulder. You then need to hide the target with fingers posture and then divide the target dimension by number to get distance. So all of that is, um, all of that is basically a way of, uh, of um, uh, manually estimating range for shooting and stuff, I guess. Um, and I, I had a quick Google and found a, a poster uh, from the US Army or something from, from some time ago. I, I think that guy's just holding his fingers out. I don't think he's doing anything else, but you never know with the Americans. If, if you um, watch, um, if you watch, the first couple of episodes of Band of Brothers, you'll see all this hand action That's right. in action with um, Major Winters or Captain That's Winters or Lieutenant Winters, actually. It was. Lieutenant, I think it was. The time. I completely forgotten about that. That's a really good thing. I'd forgotten about that. Thank you. Yeah, so that's so all about manual kind of range finding. So um, kind of interesting. Um, Seth says to tie it into an earlier watch, that downward bevel towards the crystal is reminiscent of the shape you get on a late 17th century watch like Greg Stumpkin. I, I love the pneumatic. I think their design is very industrial Italian. I had the pleasure of racing these guys up the Panina Pass um, 2019. Very nice guys, car nuts and design nuts. And I think they make great watches. I particularly like their sponge bob. Limited edition. Spongebob 2. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, the Spongebob's cool. Um, the Spongebob's very cool. And their, their dive watch is, um, is pretty good too. A nice big big bezel on it, single loom, uh, spot at 12. They really have the absolute incredible discipline of when to stop to add things to the dial. 
very good. Nice. Any questions from anyone, Matt? Uh, no open questions. Um, Sander said, in an odd way, it seems to resemble the Speedmaster Mark II in the way it sits on the wrist. That's interesting because I had a Speedy Mark II, which I got rid of because I couldn't couldn't wear it. And I, I think you're right. I think it does wobble like a like a Mark II. Um, Richard Stenning likes the UFO, the UFO style case. UFO. Yeah, okay. yeah. And Wolfie says he's getting hints of his previous design that became a Smith's PRS 40. So Time Factors released a watch a few years ago, the PRS 40, which I think is the one that has the has the um, pass-through strap that goes through the lugs. Um, uh, the lugs are kind of attached to the to the watch um, and the strap goes through and underneath and through. I think that's the PRS 40, that might be wrong. It made me think of it uh, when you we sent me the pictures earlier of the um, Marathon US Air Force watch from the 80s, which is like the, 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 the steel domes up massively. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Interesting piece of design. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. Um, so having been mildly and gently and in a fun way bullied by Paul earlier in the week about my uh, slight Omega obsession, I picked a watch that wasn't an Omega um, to talk about. So <laughs> Matt's doing a little dance there. So this is um, a Marvin Flying Dutchman automatic calendar, which looks like this. Uh, you, you possibly haven't seen one of these before. They're a little bit unloved and you see when they are for sale, they're normally in really bad state. Um, I first saw one of these in, I think, 2014. Um, I was working in the city of London, and on Thursdays in Spitalfields Market, there is a flea market, and there were two watch dealers that used to appear there. One of them who's called Nikki, and she's really well known, um, and the other, a guy whose name I, for the life of me, can't remember. But Nikki had one of these in solid gold, um, and that wasn't really my thing. And also it was really expensive because it was solid gold. And the other guy had one in steel and he wanted as much for the steel one as she wanted for the solid gold one, which I thought was a bit daft. Um, but he told me that if I didn't buy his, I wouldn't find another one. And I laughed at him a little bit and said, ha, huh, yeah, whatever. There's loads of watches. And it took me six years to find this. Um, in fact, as I found this, I found another one uh, within a week. So I bought both of them because, you know, you can't let them you can't let them escape when you find them. So one of them is with James Harris at the moment, um, and that is a auto date. Uh, these have got inside of them a caliber 580, which is the only movement um, made by Marvin. They used to buy movements that um, became part of the ETA group. They used to use a child movements, um, but this was a movement they made in house. So this is, this is quite a small watch. It's, it's 34, 35 millimeters plus the crown. Um, it's called the Flying Dutchman over a connection with KLM, who Marvin originally partnered with in 1955 for the slightly earlier version of this, which has got a textured dial and it had hermetic on it, which means vaguely water resistant. Um, having seen the state of some of those early watches, I don't think they were that water resistant because a lot of them appear to have had quite a lot of water in them. Um, but this is the later version. Uh, it has got applied markers at um, 12, 6 and 9 and then uh, printed on markers for the other numerals. Um, there is an, a trapezoid date window with a little bit, a tiny bit of metal uh, lining around it. And then this has got the original crystal on it, which has got a trapezoid magnifier. Um, the other one I've got has got a generic crystal. I'm well informed that you can't, for love nor money, find these original types in the right sizes with trapezoids. Um, so it's a little bit grotty. It came from a dealer in Israel who told me that these things just show up sometimes and he's got two in one bag of, like, I think a big bag of watches um, and I bought both of them. Um, it's got some nice details. So there's this nice chamfer to the lugs, um, which is quite a, a chunky chamfer. I've seen a few of them where it's polished and they've been rounded off. This one's been left alone. I think it makes a really nice piece of, of case detail. Um, along with that, there is the detail on the bezel. So this is a detail you see in a couple of uh, Rolexes from the same period, um, 34 millimeter size watches. They have this, it gets, I think it gets called a 
Thunderbird dial or Thunderbird bezel rather sometimes gets referred to as a um, uh, machine turned bezel it depends what the dealer that's selling it thinks it is um, it is a nice detail I think this case type I've also found on much much cheaper watches than this and this I don't think can have been an expensive watch these were made roughly between 1955 and 1965 um, Marvin went bankrupt a couple of times not long after that but this type of dial this type of case uh, in base metal is seen on a lot of um, time only watches with pin lever movements in uh, that are then been chromed or gold plated these these cases are stainless steel it doesn't feel like a particularly robust case like if you were to compare it to um an omega a rolex a tudor a seiko from the same kind of time they all feel more solid than this um the drilling in the lugs to take the pin bars is is not great they're not level in any way shape or form they're both different depths um there's obviously not been a whole lot of attention paid to um, those parts of the case design it's been all, all been on the top and i suspect it probably wasn't a case made by marvin as it appears in use by other companies in different types of metals um, it's got a marvin signed crown on it which is quite nice with a little little crown symbol on there and again you can see the construction of, of the case with the the big main piece the bezel that holds the crystal in place and then the case back on the underside um, the case back it says marvin waterproof this tells you sort of how old it is because it became water resistant not long after these would have been made. You couldn't say waterproof. There was no way this was waterproof. If anything, it was sort of vaguely splash resistant. Um, and inside, this is the this in-house movement of 580C. So 580 is the base movement. C means it's got a calendar and you sometimes see it with a P on, which means precision, which is their in-house rating for a chronometer. These were never sent off for testing. so they might have been chronometer but only as far as the people in marvin's marketing department were concerned um, it's a 25 joule movement it, it's got what i think is quite a nice bit of um a finishing on the movement in that the pattern that is on the rotor also carries on around the different plates of the movement and as the rotor spins around you can see the pattern swirl between the rotor and the, and the plates of the movement um, it's 25 joules uh it is quite nicely made um, it's probably the best bit about the watch uh, for, for fans of horology. Uh, the other components are nowhere near as good a quality as the movement. Um, and this is it on my wrist. It's not very big. I've got it on now. It's a tiny little thing. I, I have quite big hands and big wrists. Um, but this is a watch I really like. I'm, I'm quite a fan of these little 40s, 50s and 60s time only or time and date watches. Because um, I think you can put them on and not worry about them. Unlike some of the more modern stuff that's quite big, these do really easily slip under a cuff and you can just wear it and not worry. Two great design elements there, though, Chris. That bezel is really very nice. From, a, from an aesthetic point of view, very nice. And I like the chamfered case, of which, of course, now is famously referred to as light catcher around the horological <laughs> corridors. But... Um, uh, that's a really interesting design um, bezel and case, which I think steps that watch out. Certainly when I saw your picture of it on Instagram, it made me scurry off to eBay and find five or six for sale, but all sold. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I bought two of them. Um, I think one I paid $120 for, and this was about $160. Um, so they're not a lot of money, you know, as, as far as, as watches from the 50s made in Switzerland with decent movements inside go. Um, it's just a case of finding a good one. The other ones I've seen on forums over the years have typically um, come out of uh, Hong Kong. Like there's quite a lot of people that seem to have bought one of these on a business trip to Hong Kong where they were looking for more expensive watches and then saw one of these in a bargain corner and had to have it. And theirs are in phenomenal condition. Um, to the point of probably not never having been worn um, and the, all of the solid gold ones I've seen also have been either Hong Kong or Tokyo so the story with these goes that they were initially made for KLM pilots and then there's a clip-on version for stewards and stewardesses um, but the amount of them that are around and the material the different metals that are available the dial variants I think these must have been sold to customers as well. And there's advertising for the earlier ones. So they were, they were definitely sold to customers, at least in the US where there's magazine print ads for them. Um, but yeah, it's a nice little thing that I like. 
Very good. Any questions from anybody or is it just... <laughs> Have I blown people's minds by not picking an Omega? <laughs> Phil, Phil in the audience said that he has a rose gold cap version of this, uh, which is nice. Wow. Um, and that uh, he'd heard that the bezel was called crenellated. Interesting. Uh, which is interesting. Very cool. Yeah. What, what, what was it? You know, like crenellation, like, uh, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. on a castle. But... It's very nice, that bezel. Very nice. I will say uh, this. There's, there's a, a lad on, um, on Instagram called, I think his username is Belgian Watch Collector, Ilya who uh, his profile says he's a 16 year old watch collector from Belgium. And he got in touch when I posted pictures of these when I got them. And he has also been down the rabbit hole and trying to work out how many they made and what the variants were. And he has a few of the earlier ones with the textured dials. And he's hit exactly the same problems I have in that Marvin went bankrupt and was sold and became part of, I think the MSR group in the mid seventies, which is the people that own Vulcan and Review Thorman. And it seems no records got kept. Like, the, you know, the quartz crisis hit, everything was on fire. Um, if you couldn't sell it, it went in the bin. And that included, unfortunately, a lot of the paperwork, it seems. Um, yeah. But if anyone out there knows anything about these, I'd, I'd love to know what you know. So <laughs> do get in touch. Yeah, in fact, um, Sander asked the question, can you elaborate a little more on Marvin? I think they, um, so they were 1850, 1860, um, when they started, did a shim, uh, or did shine family wow. um, uh, so they've been around for some time um, as Chris said they, they certainly got passed around they had a bit of a resurgence about a decade ago 12-15 years ago um, and actually they were the first people to have a, a, a social media um, a, a full-time social media role um, and they were very active on the early days of watch Twitter um, before Instagram and um, I know because I accidentally won a competition and I have a Marvin Quartz watch somewhere. Um, but anyway, yeah. it's an interesting brand. Yeah, the, the thread that Phil references, I'm, I'm involved in that thread, thread Phil. <laughs> um, and Ilya is also in that thread asking questions about these watches. Um, I think it's one of those, it's like there's, there's all these sort of little nerdy side routes you can take with watch collecting and they don't go anywhere because no one knows any more information because it wasn't, if it was written down, it wasn't kept. Uh, and these are not like, they're not interesting enough for more people to want to know about them. Marvin these days, if you do a, you know, an eBay search for Marvin watches, it, it brings up all the modern ones, which I think have got a mix of ETA and Citizen or Seiko movements. And I think are made somewhere in Asia. Um, so the brand name carries on, but I don't think they even market them in Europe. The, the website when I looked at it earlier came up um, I think in Chinese or Mandarin rather. It's like it's it's a, just another another brand name now. All these lovely watch companies that no longer exist. Yeah, name, isn't it? yeah, but it's interesting, you know. It gives us all something to talk about. Absolutely. And it's not Omega, Chris. It's yeah. not Omega. It's not all. I mean, it, I, it, I, I'm not going to lie to you. It's my first horological love, but I do like other things. Um, <laughs> Greg's yawn, other yawns that I've seen, you know, the Tom yeah, was, <laughs> Mother of Pearl, Black Dial, lovely. Yeah. I'm going to demand that on all watches from now on. I want to uh, continue the tradition, Chris. I do have a few of those. Good, good. Brilliant. Lovely. <laughs> we'll get together and talk about that soon. Yeah. Um, I'm still intrigued as to how Matt accidentally won a competition. Uh, it was one of those things when, if you were like the three thousandth follower or something, <laughs> right, okay. it was it was yeah something random. It was pretty random. Accidentally won, fantastic. Um, I think that that that's probably us done for today. We've nearly done an hour of us talking nonsense, which I think we should let people have their Sunday evening back. Um, good. good. Thank you to uh, my co-host Matt and thank you to Greg and to Paul for um, joining us. Mm -hmm. um, thank you to everybody at home for coming along, listening, watching, asking questions, putting up with our nonsense. Without you, it'd be a very different, no, it'd be the same conversation. It'd just be four of us without everyone else. Um, <laughs> frankly, that's what would happen. Um, and uh, we'll be back again next week. Um, so I hope to see you all soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, one and all. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye.